Attention! This is the Painting Detail, Episode 1. We have a three-part mission. Segment 1, the Skills Segment. We're going to be learning to clean and prepare your wargaming miniatures. In Segment 2, that's the Supply Depot. With me, Sergeant Murder. We're going to be looking at a hobby starter paint set from Army Painter. And in Segment number 3, the Speed Painting Segment, we're going to paint a cobalt warrior. So if you're ready, grab a seat. It's time for the painting detail. and welcome to the Pain Detail. I'm your host Enrico Nardini for PlayOnPlug.com and today in the skills segment we're going to be learning how to assemble and clean your wargaming miniatures. So I have a variety of tools here with a variety of purposes and I also have a selection of miniatures all from different materials that you'll find commonly in the industry. And so we're going to look over each tool individually and then we'll go back and we'll work, we'll use all these different tools to assemble the selection of miniatures that I have here at the table. So the first thing I've got is uh, you're, we're going to be using some glue because the miniatures that I have selected are going to require at least some assembly. Even the models that are single piece will be glued onto a base for gaming purposes. So I have super glue and plastic glue. Now this plastic glue can only really be used effectively with injection molded styrene plastic kits. Everything else that we're going to work on today, including some other different types of plastic, is going to use this super glue. I also have a hobby knife or scalpel, a selection of files, and a pair of clippers. In addition to those, I've selected a few different kits. One styrene plastic kit, one resin miniature, one of the popular resin plastic hybrid type miniatures, things that you would see from say a company like Mantic or Privateer Press. This happens to be a Mantic Dreadball player. This kind of softer plastic, something similar to a D&D miniature, this is from the popular Reaper Bones line. And lastly, a pewter miniature. This, kind of, this is a lead and pewter figures were kind of the originators of all of this. So, and you will still very commonly find figures cast in pewter. Not so much in lead anymore. Uh, more, those are more rare. Now let's take a look at assembling a multi-part styrene plastic kit. Okay, here we are with our sprue. This one happens to be from War Games Factory. It's a World War II Russian set. And so I'm going to select a model, and then I'm going to clip a model off the sprue. Now here are my clippers, and so close up, these are from the Army Painter. Uh, these can, kind of clippers can be ordered off the website. And I have, on our clippers you'll see, it's tapered to one end. So there's like a flatter part here, and then here is where there's a bend. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to put the flat part against where the model and the sprue meet. So here's the plastic sprue. Injection molded plastic models come on a sprue like this. You'll see all the all these different parts. And what it is is it's a steel mold. It's a tooled steel mold where liquid plastic is injected into it and then it hardens and then you have your models. They open up the steel mold and out pops the sprue. And so I'm going to go in, I'm going to select a body. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to line up the flat side with the part of the miniature on the sprue that we're going to try to clip off. You can see where the miniature and the sprue join. So I'm going to select, I'm actually going to select this body. He kind of looks like he's in a position about to throw. And so I'm going to take this one. I, there's a there's an arm on here with a grenade. I'd like to I'd like to make a model kind of maybe mid mid tossing that grenade. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to clip these off. And you'll notice I have the flat part of my clipper up against the foot 
where it meets the sprue where it meets the uh, sprue that it's on. Clip, turn it around so you can see. I'm going to go up to where the head is and do the same thing. Clip, and the mo the model will come right out. We'll clean this up separately, and I'll show you how to do that. But I'm going to go through and clip the rest of the parts out that I need. Now, these Wargames factory sprues are pretty unique because they actually have the base included, which is kind of a unique feature. A lot of times you'll see a separate base like this. But here, they're actually just attached to the sprue. So I'm going to clip that off. I'm going to come in the same thing, same principle, flat side against where it meets the sprue. We'll clip that off. And I'm actually going to use my clipper one more time just to get that little burr a little more reduced so that when I do my knife work later, it'll be easier. Put that separate. And then I'm going to select those arms and a head. So I need two arms and a head. I'm going to have one. I'm going to take this one where it's holding the gun. And I'm going to clip that off. Same idea. Clip. And very careful because this barrel is thin. There we go. And then I'm going to clip this grenade arm. Same principle. And lastly, I'm going to turn this over so we can see the heads. And I'm going to look for a head that I think is going to look cool. I want one that's kind of expressive, like, ah, here's one where it looks like the soldier's yelling. So maybe he's yelling for them to get into cover because he's going to throw the grenade. And I'll clip that off the same way. And here we have our pieces. We'll move on to assembly. Okay, so here's our hobby knife or scalpel. I prefer to use a hobby knife or a scalpel to clean up these kind of plastic models. You can use a file, and when I go over filing on our metal miniature, uh, the same techniques will work. Though, once again, for my purposes, and you'll, you may try uh, these techniques out and prefer the file, I prefer to use a hobby knife for almost every plastic kit that I've ever used. Really, the hobby knife's all I've ever needed, but there are some people who do use files for plastic models, and, and they, it is usable, though I would caution that you do not want to file very quickly because you don't want to create a lot of friction and melt the plastic. That actually can happen if you file too hard and too fast. So anyway, we have our pieces here, and so I'm going to demonstrate a technique that's going to make it easy for you to clean up these models, and then I'll clean them all up. Uh, the technique is called back scraping, and so one thing, well, before I even go to the back scraping, our hobby knife, we want to make sure it's got a very sharp blade. It's actually much safer to do this with a sharp blade than with a um, with a dull blade because the dull blade could get stuck. You'll you'll try to force it when it doesn't need to be forced. But I'm going to be looking at these little parts where it's joined, and I'm just going to cut those off. And I'm cutting away from myself. We don't we never want to cut towards ourselves. That's also a safety issue. So I'm cutting away from myself. Then I'm going to look for mold lines. And mold lines are little lines where, and hopefully the camera's picking that up, there we go. Mold lines are little areas, if I can point that out right there, where the mold, where it fits together, it's not absolutely perfect, and so there's a little trace of where the plastic is kind of leaked out between the two halves. Now, you might say to yourself, wow, Rico, that line is so tiny. Is that really important? The thing is, once we add paint and start shading and things like that, the line becomes more pronounced. So even a faint line like that is noticeable. And it's so easy to clean up that really there's no point in us not just trying to clean it up and make it look nicer. So I'm going to go down, and what I do is I put the knife down perpendicular to the mold line. I tilt it a little bit towards me, and then I scrape away. And that's going to allow me to just scrape the mold line right off. And I'll go back, and it's because now I have an idea of the grain of the miniature, which way the mold was set. And since I have that, I have an idea of that, I can go in and do the same thing. Come in, and there's the mold line right there, and I'm going to scrape it off. And it's called back scraping, obviously, because I'm scraping backwards. I'm scraping away. Once again, also helpful with the safety. Even though your knife, the knife is pointed towards you since you're scraping away, it's a relatively safe technique. Of course, if you're a child, you need to ask your parents' permission to use anything like a hobby scalpel. It does take some time uh, to develop your technique using it, and you don't want to hurt yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to clean up the rest of these models, and we'll go on to assembly. Okay, so my miniatures are now clipped and cleaned, and I'm going to go in, and they're not perfectly clean, but, you know, for our purposes for the show, we got to keep moving. And so I have my plastic glue, 
and once again, stuff that you can purchase on the sh uh, from the show store on playunplug.com. And I'm going to go in. I'm just going to put a little bit of glue on the feet. And this is a case where when we're gluing models with these plastic glues and super glues, generally speaking, a little goes a long way. We don't need to slather the model in glue. So, and then we'll place him here. And I'm going to hold it for a few seconds until it becomes tacky and I feel like it can stand. And so we'll let that set. So I finished assembling the rest of the model. And now I just want to show a quick technique for flat to flat surfaces. If you have a flat to flat surface and you're not going to pin it, which is a more advanced technique that we can go over later, the best thing to do is to at least score the sides that are going to be connected. And what I mean by that is I'm going to take my hobby knife and I'm going to take the flat surface here and I am going to go and make a few lines. Now don't worry, this is not a part of you know, the model that's going to be seen at all. And then I'm going to turn it and I'm going to cross hatch it. And this will just give the glue a little bit better place to anchor. And then I apply a little bit of glue to the place where I cross hatched. And then I can put, apply this right to the side of the model. The last thing you're going to notice is I did not finish cleaning the helmet. You probably can see that mold line right there. And I'm not going to clean that until it's a very small part. It's hard for me to hold my hands. So, since I assembled the model, I'm not going to clean that till it sets. Once it sets and I can grip the model by the base and I have a lot of control, then I'll go back and clean the mold line off the head. Here's our fully assembled Russian soldier in his pose, ready to throw that grenade. And we've got him nice and nicely cleaned up. And there you have it. Let's move on now to cleaning and assembling a resin miniature. So here I have an orc archer from Ramshackle Games. I'm quite fond of these. They have a really unique look. And these are cast in resin. And so with resin miniatures, uh, you'll find a lot of variety. Some resins are, feel a little bit softer. This resin feels quite hard. Um, the, you'll notice that it is shiny. It's got some release agents still on it. So with any resin model, especially, it seems to be much more uh, often with resin than the other uh, miniatures that we've seen so far, the other materials we've seen so far. Though you could do this with all of your miniatures, and it's not a bad habit to be in. Take some room temperature water and a little bit of dish soap, and you're going to soak them, just, just quickly soak them in that, and give them a little bit of a rub, gentle rub, and then dry them off. And that'll get that off, and then you can go back and clean, and this way it'll take the primer a lot better. But we'll get into priming, that'll be part of next episode. However, what we can see is, there's some, we've got some, of course, a little bit of mold lines, and we also have some flashing, where you can see that the resin mold was overfilled. And so, there are thin layers of resin in between where these legs are, where the, where the mold, where it seeped out of the mold. So we clean this the exact same way. Now with resin, we can use a file, by the way, and there are times when a file is going to be quite effective. However, one thing to keep in mind with resin, especially more so than the other materials that you'd normally use a file with, like pewter, is you, you really need to wear a mask because the dust, the resin dust that you're going to create with that file is toxic and you do not want to breathe it in. So, but if we're trimming with a knife, not as much of a problem so long as we're not scraping and creating dust. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to cut out the, just cutting that flash out right there. And once again, I'm following the natural curve of the miniature. Now you'll see this kind of resin, and not all resins are like this. This resin is a little bit more brittle in the sense that it'll crack if you go too hard. So once again, I'm just gentleness is just the word of the day when it comes to cleaning these. We don't want to be too rough. So but we can get all the flash out that way. And you can go around all the mold lines the same way, just gently scraping away from you to get those off. There's a little bit of a, for example, there's a little imperfection right here, once again, where it's, it's probably from an overfilled mold, and I can just scrape that off. And you can always wear a painter's mask to protect yourself from breathing, breathing in any of the dust from any of the things that you're using. And you can always wear goggles too, though I tend to, because I have glasses, I just tend to not. 
Um, but it's never bad advice to take to have a little bit of extra precautions. And that's how I would clean this up. Same thing. Now this has an integrated base, but you could also easily mount it on one of these circle bases. Now we'll take a look at a multi-part ResTech miniature. So here we have a Mantic Dreadball player, and these are cast in what is called uh, commonly in the hobby as ResTech. I've heard that term many times. Uh, it's really just it's a resin plastic mix, and it does not, you cannot use plastic glue on these actually at all. They won't stick together. You're going to have to use super glue. So cleaning these up though is relatively simple. It's, uh, they have a lot of similar properties to plastic. Once again, you can use a file. I rarely have to use one. I usually can get away with just using the hobby knife again. And what we're going to do here is I don't do a lot of back scraping. You'll see if I back scrape this, the plastic kind of curls off in little strings. And so that makes it a little bit difficult. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to scrape. And once again, I'm scraping away. But I'm just following, gently following the contour of the miniature. Getting into these cracks and scraping the mold lines away. And it can be a little bit time consuming but it's work well worth the effort. The overall finished look, even if you are just doing flat colors on these and you're a very new painter, you're not doing tons of shading and things like that, just having a clean looking model will be very much to your benefit for the final outcome. So take a little bit of extra time. It can be very cathartic to sit and assemble and scrape these mold lines off, very relaxing from a stressful day. Just gently scrape the mold lines off. Once again, file can be used, but for our purposes today, I, I usually find with these with the, with these uh, smaller, simple figures, not an issue. Now this burr here might be an issue, so we're gonna we're gonna scrape that off too. I'm gonna put my blade there and really just cut into that a little bit, and I want to make sure where the fig where the parts of the figure are gonna join are going to join up nicely. So I can do a test fit now and put that in. But I notice these models, a lot of these ResTech models, they come cut off the sprue already where you're, when you get them. But here is where it was attached to a sprue at some point. It's in some point's manufacturer. So I'm just going to come down. And I'm going to gently cut once again away from me and cut that bit off so that I have a smooth surface. And then I'll test the fit these again. Now there's a mold line on this arm too. So I would normally take the time to scrape that off as well, but I want to move on to the next uh, piece. So we'll just take a look at this head. I'm going to test fit that too, and this does not fit as well, so I'm going to have to take a look. It looks like it's warped a little bit in the casting, which does sometimes happen. You might notice right there, it looks like there's a little bit of a warped casting there. And I think the peg is a little bit large, so we're going to kind of work with both of those things. The first thing I'm going to do is I see a burr here, and I'm going to cut it off. Okay, then I'm going to go back to my clippers and I'm going to trim this peg down. I don't want to trim it too far down because I do want my figure to be able to anchor in. Okay, I still want this to be able to anchor in, but I'm going to try to make it a little bit easier for myself to get this guy in there. In this case, less is more again. I can't it's going to be very difficult for me to put stuff back on. So better to trim a little bit, test, and then go back. Let's see. Any luck? Still having a little bit of difficulty getting this to fit in here. There we go. That's better, but we can see it's still, the, that peg is still creating a bit of a gap. So I'm going to go back, cut it down just a little bit more. Try it again. Oops. Whenever you're working with little parts, there's always that risk of dropping. And that looks pretty close. All right. Might need to trim it up just a little bit. If I do, I can just go down and little quick trims. 
just to make sure it fits. Like I said, be very careful in the sense that you do not want to trim too much off so that there's nothing for it to anchor onto. All right. And then, just like with the plastic assembly, I'd go through, these are the kind of bases that this uses. I'd cut these off the sprue, and then using super glue, I'll, I would put all of these pieces together. Now we'll clean and assemble a miniature from the Reaper Bones line. Okay, so here's a Reaper Bones orc with a sphere, and the Reaper Bones material is like a soft plastic. If you're familiar with Dungeons & Dragons miniatures, then you'll be familiar with this. I had to put this yellow post-it note in the background so that the glare, it wouldn't pick up the glare so we could get a better look at this. And so you can see there's a mold line right down here where my finger is, and it goes all the way down this spear. Now, for the Reaper Bones line, I've found files are not the best bet. I would definitely go hobby knife here, and you'll see, so we've been using the hobby knife for a lot of things, and it's very versatile that way. Same idea here. Back scraping I also don't like to do with these. You can, but it does tend to make it flake off, similar to the, the things that we saw with the ResTech. So I would clean this in a very similar way, where I would just allow my knife to gently follow the contour of the model and get the extra plastic off. Just go down, following the natural contours. Being very careful, this is a soft plastic, and we do want to take it careful and gentle because if we push too hard, we're going to dig right into it, and then we'll be damaging some of the detail. I'd go all the way around. Then you can, of course, mount this on a base if you'd like to, or use the tab, the tab base that it already has. And lastly, let's take a look at the founding father of toy soldiers, the metal miniature. So for metal models like this Peter French Indian War Soldier, you can see there's a lot of different things going on here. Number one, there are some vents where the liquid pewter would seep into the mold. And so these are still attached. And for these, we're going to once again use our clippers. And kind of imagine this is like a sprue flat against the surface of the actual miniature. And we're just going to trim them off. Now I really want to be careful. Now this happening, don't worry too much. You've got, Peter's got a little bit of a bend, and you can bend it back without too much of a problem. It's not as flexible as lead, so you don't want to bend it a number of times back and forth. It will snap off, but one or two bends, you should be all right. So once again, I'm being, but I am going to be a little bit careful because this bayonet is small. Clip that off, and I'd rather leave a little bit of metal on there that I have to clean off later than clip too close. We've been keep talking about that, this less is more concept that we want to keep in our minds. So now, here, you're going to see also things like this. Once again, that's a venting thing. We can cut those off with our hobby knife. These little areas. Same thing, I can trim down and get this bayonet looking the way it's supposed to go. Cutting away from myself. I can bend it back into shape with my hand or with a pair of pliers to try to get it to be to try to get it straight out again. And for the mold lines, this is a time when I'm definitely going to use files for my file set. So I have three different kinds of file. Here. Let's look at each one. So this is a flat. Works best for flat surfaces. Not going to be too useful on this model because there's so many curves. This angled one could come in handy occasionally for tight spaces, but the one I tend to use the most is the round. And this one's completely round all the way around. So I'm going to look for the mold lines. Here they are. And I'm going to go in with my round, and what I'm going to do is, and I love how it gets into those little spaces. It's so great for that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go forward, away from myself, and each time I go down, I'm actually picking the file back up. I'm not jamming it back and forth. I'm not doing a sawing motion. I go down, and I pick it back up, and I go across. And I'm just gently, once again, gentle is the word, going through and removing those mold lines without damaging the detail. I don't need to dig it or jam it in there. Let the file do the work. You do have to apply a little bit of pressure, but you can let the file do the work. Let the tool do its job. Just go in there. I can get all the mold lines off this way, and like I said, I'm going down, picking it back up. If I went really slowly, just to show you, 
Once you get good at this motion, you'll do it quite quickly. But I'm going down, picking it up, and coming back. Not sawing back and forth. And you'll see, this does create some pewter dust. Um, it seems to me always to be heavy enough that it just drops to the ground, but if you're worried, once again, get that painter's mask on, you'll be fine. This one, when I'm done, it's a single piece model, and what I would do is just score the bottom with my knife, once again. I might even trim this little bit of stuff off, but I'd score the model on the bottom, doing that like cross hashing. And then I could just take some super glue, apply it to the bottom, put it right on top of the base, and let it sit. I brought this model out because you'll commonly see this with plastic and metal models, is this model with a tab. We call it a slot of base. And so here's the actual slot of base. This is the, the tab that goes into the slot. And so it sits like this. However, you'll see there's a lot of play there. And so that can make it difficult when you're gluing these down. So one thing you can do once you've cleaned this model is you can go in with your pliers and gently bend it so that it gets a little bit of a bend in the base. I might want to do it just a little bit more. I'm just taking it, I'm turning it gently. I don't want to turn it really hard. I want to bend the feet in a weird direction. I want to keep the integrity of the model. But then I can go in, I need a little bit more, a little bit more of a bend. But like I said, better to bend less. And now, there we go. A little bit closer. I'm going to give it one more little tweak. See the crimp I put in it? And I'm going to go in, and now it's going to be a little bit harder to get it in, but once I apply my super glue and put the model in like this, it's not going anywhere. Like right now, it's already pretty much firmly set in there. So it's going to make that a lot easier to work with. And then if I say wanted to glue this shield on, assuming I had cleaned the model, this part of the hand is not going to show once the shield's on, so same thing. Give it a little bit of a scoring. I can score the inside of the shield with super glue. Same issue. Less is more. Take my super glue off. I'm going to put just a tiny little drop on there. That might even be a little bit too much. And then I can stick the shield on, hold it for a few seconds, let it set. And then I'll, once I, I, I let it go a little bit longer than this, but for the sake of the video, let it set, and then you can move on. And that's assembling your metal miniatures. I hope you enjoyed our time today in the skills segment, assembling and cleaning your wargaming miniatures. You can find each of the tools that we use today listed on the Play Unplugged online store at playunplugged.com. You can also buy the episode one package, which will include one of each of the tools that we've presented today. And you'll find everything there at 10% off its manufacturer's suggested retail price. Oh, I think I hear Sergeant Murder calling. We better go check in at the supply depot. <clears throat> Never throw something in a sergeant. Oh, it's time for the supply depot. What's this? War Games Hobby starter paint set from the Army Painter. Nine core colors. Everything a beginning painter could need. There's a brush included and a free quick shade ink for shading your miniatures. You can get this for $24.75 at the Play Unplugged web store. Just visit playunplugged.com and click on store. You'll find this and many other great miniature painting products at 10% off their MSRP. So get moving, soldier! In the speed painting segment, we're going to be painting a Cobalt Warrior from the Reaper Bones line. We're going to start with our Cobalt Warrior. Now the goal of this part of the show is just to show you some ways that you can quickly get models table ready uh, without too much fuss and muss. And so we're going to paint this warrior and we're going to try to paint him to completion in a short period of time. Now I started, one of the best ways to get started is with an Army Painter uh, color spray because that's going to give me my base coat and it's going to let me I, most of this model, most of this cobalt I intend to be red, 
kobolds uh, often have red flesh, and so I'm going to use this as this flesh tone, which is actually the majority of the model. Now, there are areas, since this is a spray primer, where the spray primer didn't get into. That's okay, because this dragon red is a 100% match to the dragon red that I sprayed this with. So that's going to be useful. So now would be a good time to go over all the colors that we're going to use today. So we're going to use dragon red, matte black, uniform gray, leather brown, gun metal, Skeleton Bone, Weapon Bronze, and the Strong Tone Quickshade Ink. All right, first thing I'm gonna do, always shaking up my paint, of course. I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna put a little bit of that Dragon Red down on my palette. Add a little bit of water. Then I'm gonna go in, and I'm using a fairly large brush because once again, mixing it up, I want my paint to be pretty fluid. Not too fluid though, because once again, we're trying to do this in one go. As a general rule, if I was painting for say a competition, or for display, or for my own, just uh, because I like to paint for fun, more thin layers are generally, as a rule, better than one thick layer, especially because you don't want to obscure detail. But for our purposes, we're trying to get a model ready for the tabletop quickly. So I'm going to use a little bit thicker paint. There we go. Now we would let this dry, but of course we're going to do this assembly line style. So you can imagine you have six or eight or ten of these guys lined up, and so you can go on and, and just touch up the red on every figure. Look where the primer wouldn't go into these creases and cracks. And just come in, touch all that up. Okay. While that's drying, now once again, if you're doing this assembly line style, you're gonna be moving down, and by the time you get back to the first miniature, the red will be dry on that, and you can move on to the next step. But I'm just gonna to try to pick steps that are not going to interfere with what I just did. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna black out the eyes. I'm going to take a little bit of matte black, and I'm using brushes from the Hobby Brush Paint Set. That's something you can actually purchase on our website. It's a three brush set. They're fairly cheap. Uh, there's a dry brush. There's a standard brush, which is what I'm using, and there's a detail brush, which is what I'm about to use to black out the eyes. Now, adding a little bit of water here, and I'm taking this finer, this thinner, smaller brush, and I'm just going to go in from a distance. If you're speed painting, once again, there are techniques that we can use to get to bring out the eyes and make them look really nice. But if since we're speed painting here, I really just want to define where the eye is, and so I'm going to black it out. And from a distance on the tabletop, it's just going to look like it's in shadow, which for our purposes, for this, will suit us perfectly. So there we go. And if I get a little bit, if I make a little happy mistake here, and I have a little bit outside, well, that's easy enough to fix. With acrylic paints, they dry fairly quickly, especially when you, if you're using them a little bit thicker than normal. And so I can just wait for that black to dry and go back into my Dragon Red and touch it back up so that all I have is the red. The next largest uh, part, and we want to generally paint from the inside out, the next largest part is going to be his vest and his loincloth and pouches. So I'm going to paint those in leather, and while I'm at it, I'm going to get the top of this spear right there and the actual spear shaft. It's okay, once again, since we're focused on just trying to get these miniatures onto the table, it's okay to use the same brown tone for both of those, for both his clothes and his spear. They're separated. The brown will be separated by his hand and body, so it's really not going to be super noticeable. And it's going to speed up, once again our goal is to get this on the table, it's going to speed up our paint time significantly. You'll also notice I'm, I'm trying not to use any mixes if I can avoid it. 
Once again, being able to just water down paint out of the bottle is going to save you time if your goal is speed. So I'm going to go in right across down here and once I apply my wash even where this belt is actually touching the his little loincloth here even where that's touching I'm still going to be able to go in because once I apply the wash it's gonna put some definition between them it's gonna darken up that area between them so it's not gonna be a problem going in and around you'll notice I'm changing my position I have this cardboard glued on because I, I want to try to grip the model as little as possible. That can mess with you. But at the same time, there are just some areas you just can't help it. You just can't help but grip the model a certain way. I'm going to have to add more water. My paint's thickening up. The thing about acrylic paints, of course, is that they dry quickly. So you're always want re rewatering them down. Better to do it once the correct way than to rush it. In the long run you'll save time if you're just taking your time and applying the paint correctly so that it goes where you want it to go. With the exception of the red, which we saved a lot of time on by spraying, this will probably be the second most, the second longest part of this. And once again I'm going to get the pouch, the same thing. If I wanted to get fancy, I could use a different tone of brown or some other color for the pouch. But I don't feel like being fancy right at the moment. I'm trying to get these cobalts done for my next adventure. I just wanted to look good on the tabletop and help people get into the game. You can see underneath, just like where the primer wouldn't normally hit, I've got to make sure I get brown underneath here, the underside of that vest. I'm going to go on to the metal now. And for that I'm going to start with gun metal. I'm going to use the gun metal for the spear tip, for the belt, and for the blade of the sword. little bit of water and I'm just using an an old brush that's beat up to add the water and mix the paint up all right take that and here we go right into there right there right there okay other side of the blade there and there Spear tip. Now down here, you'll see there's some little uh, spikes on his loincloth, and I'm just going to touch, 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 just give the impression of the metal. And then for the belt, I'm going to go in with the metal, and I'll go back and put a dot of brown in the middle to show where the belt's gone through, but for now I'm just going to put it right on top and then I'm going to get the shoulder pad too and I'm just going under and once again making sure I hit the areas where if I'm not careful and not paying attention you don't want to forget them underneath when I put the wash on it'll generally darken those areas anyway, but I always feel like it's good to be thorough. While this metal is drying, I'm going to add some interest to the sword. I could paint the sword completely in steel, but it's going to look kind of boring because the hilt and the, and the actual blade touch each other. So to add a little bit of interest, I'm just going to come in and make that part brown, bronze. So there's my weapon bronze.
And then I can go in and go right on top of this sword hilt. And I'll make the handle bronze too, why not? I'm going to go into the skeleton bone. And I'm going to do the horns and the teeth and the, the claws on the feet. Just a little bit of skeleton bone. That's pretty thick. I'm going to want to thin that out a little bit. And here we go, horns first. And then teeth. And I'm just touching them really. Down here the claws on the toes. Once again, just a little touch touch, touch, but they stand out really nicely when you do that, touch, touch. I have all the flat colors where I want them to be. Now of course, once I paint the base, this would be fine honestly on the tabletop, but I can add some more interest and, and, and make this look a little, give it some depth by adding a wash without, um, with, without adding too much time to the process. But first we gotta paint the base, and I'd imagine this guy is hanging out in a dungeon somewhere, so I'm gonna go uniform gray on the base. There we go. Actually, I put in a little bit of wet metallic there, and I don't wanna use that with the mix. I wanna mix those together. So, I'm gonna take this more beat up brush. I'm just gonna go right in there, and I'm gonna cover the base. And I'm using it straight out of the bottle, really, for this part, because that red is going to show up through there if I don't. And once again, when I get to the feet, I want to just try to be careful. Okay, we're here with our Cobalt Warrior all blocked out. has all of its flat color. And now we're going to use an ink wash to add some shade and depth to the figure. And this is going to be quick. We're going to do what's commonly referred to as staining the figure. So I'm going to put this quick shade strong tone down on my palette. I'm going to get out that butt, that beat up brush. I'm just going to dip into it straight out of the bottle, and I'm going to go over the entire figure, even the base, because this will shade the base too. Now there are things I can do to bring the color back up after I do this. I could go back and using the same colors highlight it because this will, even though it'll sink into the recesses, that's our goal, and add a lot of shading, it will tint the entire miniature a darker color. It's going to stain the whole thing. Uh, the, what we're really shooting for is this uh, depth. We're trying to get the shade into the cracks. In the same way you'll see as we go, if it starts to pool in an area that I don't want it to, I'm just going to take the brush and pull it back off as necessary. You can see even before it dries. See how now it's pooling up on the blade and I'm just pulling it off. I don't need that much on there. It's a flat surface. It's going to look unusual if I have too much on that flat surface. So I'm going in and I'm just trying to get good coverage of the figure and I'm not worried at all about it going onto the base uh, because I want it to shade the base too and give the base some texture. So I'm going around and like I said you know, this is not something where I have to be very cautious because I can, it's, you know, it's wet. I can pull it back off if I need to. And I want it to cover and get into the cracks of the model to define all those different features and bring out the details. Now I'm just finishing up, making sure I get the entire base because, like I said, I want to add, I want to see the depth there too. But once again, pulling it off anywhere that it starts to pool up too much or in an area where it shouldn't have depth, it shouldn't be pooling up in, like a flat surface. And now I've gotten pretty much the whole thing covered, so I'm just going to go back around and I'm just going to check and make sure it's sitting the way I'd like it to sit. Here we have our Cobalt Warrior, and he's pretty much dry. 
Got a little bit of wet wash under there, but you can see how the, the wash has seeped into the crevices and given him some definition. Now he looks pretty well shaded, and so does the ground he's standing on. Now his head's pretty much completely dry, so I'm going to grab it by there because what I'm going to do next is I'm going to add some black around the rim of the base just to clean it up, make it look nice. So once again, matte black. I add just a little bit of water. And I'll just go around the lip of the base. And what this will do is it's just going to make the whole, it's going to kind of bring everything together and clean everything up and give the figure a real finished look. I don't obviously like leaving the, the, uh, the base with that kind of like showing all the paint. Better to have it. Now you don't have to use black. You could match it with, you could use like, for example, the uniform gray to make it match the surface. But I like to have a little bit of differentiation there. And I usually use black around the rims of my bases. That's just a personal preference. Here's our finished kobold. If this project inspired you, send us pictures of your speed painted miniatures to our Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Play Unplugged. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Painting Detail. For more news, reviews, and hobby tips, all about the world of Unplugged Tabletop Gaming, make sure you check out PlayUnplugged.com. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and also leave a comment because we love to hear from you guys. We'll see you next time.